Dear friends and colleagues, welcome back to Milan for the SS meeting. I hope you enjoy the Milanese hospitality with uh, his uh, art, with his fashion, his food, and all the beauties that the city offers. I wish you a nice meeting, a nice uh, time, and enjoyable stay in Milan. When I received the invitation to do this year heritage lecture, I immediately decided to do the history of IOS. Why? Because the IOS really changed dramatically the vision and life of millions and millions of people. Before IOS, the cataract operation with affect glasses gave a poor quality of vision with significant image distortion and great limitation of the field of view. Because of fake glasses preventing people from calling out a personal, normal, and working life, cataract surgery will be delayed until the vision was already poor. I will dramatically change the vision following cataract surgery. And having decided to tell the history of IONS, a video story seemed the best approach to do. I had a hard time to find good material, good historical material, and I leave it to you to evaluate the result of my research involving colleagues from all around the world. And I deeply thank all of them for their important support. The research is never finished. You may think it is, but it's only just beginning. I would like people to think that I had the courage of my convictions. I think myself that I did a lot for implant surgery, but the more so for the patients. The patients uh, became very happy with implants. Uh, always a pleasure to, 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 to see a patient who says, Thank you, Dr. H. You restored a very important part of my life. Why did the reader implant the first higher in the posterior chamber, and what, why with that design? He simply copied the human lens by making it equal in shape and size. Why in the posterior chamber? Because the human lens sit in the posterior chamber. And because at that time he was performing extracapsular cataract surgery, and he had the posterior capsule supporting the IOL. Ridley decided the vision of millions of people sitting in a car in Cavendish Square. Now let me show you a nice video of the Ridley surgery. It's one of the very first operations beautiful one, kindly sent me by Ken Offer. As you can see, Ridley uses a dragon knife, not a very sharp one, really. And uh, it's last, making a very large incision, 180 degrees, and after with a S forceps, it's performing a quite a rudimentary capsulotomy. He then proceeds with uh, the removal of the nucleus by expression by exerting pressure at 6 o'clock and rotating the intumescent nuclear cataract outside of the eye. The remaining soft material was irrigated out of the eye and not really removed completely. Ridley was the first to implant an IOL, but also the first to see one fly off. Now the lens the lens enters the anterior chamber, and then with some movements, is positioned on the posterior chamber, resting on the posterior capsule. Then a pre-place is six zero suture, and then tightened uh, to close the wound. Ridley wanted to build up his numbers before revealing his invention to the ophthalmic world, but life intervened. And one of the Ridley patients went to see a wrong Ridley doctor, also an ophthalmologist. And with that, the cat was now out of the bag. So 
originally decided to go public at the Oxford Ophthalmological Congress in 51 and brought his of two patients as evidence of his results. And uh, the trouble started with that because he was strongly attacked by all the ophthalmologists there, especially by Duke Helder. And this situation, this problem lasted for many decades. Between the 50s and 63, Ritter implanted 750 IOS. And uh, some of them uh, were, were, were very well accepted, like this one on the, on the right side, that lasted in the eye 24 years, implanted in 76. Why Ridley abandoned his eye oil? It was too heavy, and it has a lot of dislocation inside the vitreous. So Strampelli, Baraker, and subsequently Danheim and Choice, and many other surgeons decided and implant other lenses, mainly in the anterior chamber. First, they implanted in the anterior chamber because they, they were performing intracapsular catheter surgery and because they wanted to position the lens in the anterior chamber angle. And this was also a way to avoid the dislocation in the vitreous. Well, where else in the eye could the implant be fixed? The idea of supporting haptics in the anterior chamber angle led to the first generation of anterior chamber lenses. The Strampelli rigid implant was widely used, but it was heavy and hard to fixate, and it caused damage to Decimae's membrane, leading to bullous keratopathy. In Germany, the Danheim lens had flexible nylon loop haptics, but this also met with instability, glaucoma, and corneal decompensation. So, to lessen the pressure of these loops against the peripheral cornea and angle, Joachim Barraker in Barcelona cut one arm of each Danheim loop. Although at the time this proved useless, the resulting J-shaped loops were to provide a blueprint for an excellent American implant, but not until some 25 years later. And now let me show a nice beautiful video made by Joachim Barraker, and he's implanting the Strampelli lens. As you can see, it's a rather large lens, and the lens during the insertion is touching the, the endothelium. Little was known uh, about endothelial uh, damage in implantology at that time and its posterity consequences. Baraker removed 250 of the 493 IOS he implanted in the 50s. And now let me show another nice video. It's the Danheim lens implanted by Baraker again. And this lens has closely flexible loops, different one from a full PMM lenses. Much better, I would say, but uh, still not good. And Baraker decided to cut one part of uh, the loop and he implanted the, the anterior chamber lens with open loops. From this lens derived the sharing lens implanted more than 20 years later. And now finally I want to show you a video of implantation of Mark 9 choice lens implanted by Michael Blumenthal. This video was recorded on Super 8 film and now is on digital. The anterior chamber lens, unfortunately, frequently involves the corneal decompensation. Then some surgeons like Epstein, Binkrost, and Fyodorov looking for another site to implant the eye oil, away from the vital structure of the eye, and they decided for the iris. Ozonolysis with 180 degrees of limbal incision. Cryo extraction was performed with careful protection against iris or endothelial touch. The Copeland lens was my first experience in IOL transplantation. Two haptics were inserted behind the iris and two in front. Moderate dilation was acceptable, but extreme dilation was dangerous. 
And here again, Michael Blumenthal implanting a fjorder of lens. He implanted after intracapsular cataract extraction. As you can see, also here there is a little attention to the endothelium. At that time, we, surgeon didn't know about the potential damage by the lenses. And here I'm presenting the Fyodorov Sputnik lens developed by Fyodorov in Russia. And, uh, Дровом вместе с учеником Валерием Захаровым модель линзы Спутник стала популярна во всем мире, но не сразу, а после череды гонений на родине признания методики имплантации сначала в Соединенных Штатах. And you can see that the zonal is very strong and it's quite difficult to remove the lens from the eye. And uh, he's implanting another Sputnik Fyodor file, which is a much better technique than the one that we saw before. That means he's uh, really protecting the endothelium with uh, air inside the anterior chamber. And you see that uh, there's a beautiful uh, implanting. And now again, uh, Isaac, with another special lens. You can see that this lens has two open loops, two large open loops on the back of the iris, and two closed loops in the front after intracapsular cataract extraction. Very special iris. And now let me show some uh, lenses from our... First, a thumbnail sketch to introduce you to intraocular lenses. For intraocular lens implantation, a special consent form is read and signed by the patient. American ophthalmologists should note that their regular malpractice insurance covers them fully for intraocular lens implantation. This is a model of the Binkhorst iridocapsular lens. The posterior loops are made of platinum, it is implanted as a primary procedure at the time of cataract aspiration in the young child or extracapsular extraction in the young adult. Iridocapsular adhesions must form in order for it to be held in place. This is a model of the Binkhorst iris clip lens, also called a four loop lens. Note that the anterior and posterior super mid loops are oriented. Why did the iris fixation lenses fail? They were very heavy. They were very mobile on the iris because they were implanted after intracapsular cut extraction and they were inducing a lot of systolic macular edema. And the iris did not often have a suitable structure to support the iris. So uh, Bicrost and Wurst decided to suture the iris uh, to the iris. The eyelids are spread widely with wooden applicator sticks, and the 3M adhesive incised drape is pushed down on the cornea, then molded to the separated lids, thereby isolating the untrimmed lashes from the surgical field. Small holes are cut in the drape to prevent the buildup of carbon dioxide. The 3M drape is incised like the letter H, as an aside, the patient has been premedicated with intramuscular Innovar and Valium and four ounces of oral glycerin to render the globe hypotensive. The two plastic flaps are tucked into the fornices to isolate the lashes. The lid speculum is inserted. Parenthetically, the pupil is not dilated for lens implant surgery. Thus, topical pilocarpine will easily constrict the pupil. My call is not necessary. Pegs of the plastic drape are trimmed from the cantal corners. The first eye suture were made on degradable material and therefore they lost their effect. And these lenses uh, were decentralized and displaced. So Wurst and uh, Bicus decided to move from uh, intracapsule to cataract extraction and to change the kind of suture. And they went to the still less suture No, non ha bisogno di Yolanda. 
Hmm? Ze past toch? Een beetje aan mijn kant, maar is ze een beetje zo okay. Meer aan mijn kant. Een beetje, beetje vullen. Guarda un poco. Primo, a sinistra, adesso un leggero trazione con iniezioni per l'infermiera e basta. E lasciare il cristallino in posizione. No, il candone, scusi, ne dun, ne sarà non mi dice mai rete. Su visione diretta. E che spugno. Ok, io. All the above was happening in Europe and Russia, and the Americans limited their, uh, themselves to implanting a few European lenses. But they began to change, and they designed several aisles, like uh, anterior chamber lenses, the Cayman, the Lysky, the Shepard, uh, the Zburg, and many others. So here you can see one of the first lenses, uh, is the Azer one. And uh, here is the Lysky one with one of his complications. And this is the Stablefex with one uh, of uh, typical complication of this lens. And uh, this is the Dubrov lens. And now I show you another beautiful video. I had that video from Elter Good. He went to his cellar to look for the film when I asked him to look for something for the, my lecture. This lens is a one-piece PMM lens, 3.5 optical zone, and it, it was designed for him to be implanted with effect emulsification through 4.0 incision. Kenman, the man who changed the life and sight of um, hundreds of millions of people and the professional life of uh, tens of thousands of ophthalmologists, including myself, designed many lenses, and this one uh, is the multiflex, implanted in, during video cataract in Milan. And uh, finally, in the Americas, designed a new lens, uh, a very first modern IOL, the Sharing One. Sharing well, was a very friendly person to me. I met him in 77 in Cannes when he presented his lens, derived from the anterior chamber Baraker IOL. He changed the shape of the lens and especially the position of it. He put he inserted it in the posterior chamber. His eye is the lens that led to improve the result and by drastically reducing the complication related to implantology. I was an early adopter of the sharing lens and I used to implant it after effect emulsification, after having an enlarged incision. Implantation technique was done under air, and I, I used to, to do a very simple technique, I mean, uh, very well controlled. And uh, the lens, uh, I theoretically, theoretically implanted in the sulcus. Uh, the capsulotomy was very large, it was a can opener technique, and with a bimanual technique, I and put in the lens in the posterior chamber. There is another beautiful uh, video. This is a Faulkner lens. It's a cross between a Vincros and a Sinsky lens. I implanted this at a secondary implantation. But in this video, I want above all to show you what was done for secondary cataract at that time. A cystotum was passed through the wound and through the iridectomy, I, mandatory at that time because when we were implanted IOS, we were all the time performing iridectomy, and the posterior capsule was opened. When we had the young laser, really, we had a different kind of life with our patient with posterior chamber. Posterior capsule opacification. Simcoe, I think there's a further, uh, a further uh, technique uh, tape that you would like to uh, present, and uh, uh, can you narrate it for us, please? I'd be happy to. Here we see um, placement of the sheets glide in the capsular bag behind the retaining wire. The C-shaped lens is held in the container by 
little pegs so that there's no injury to it. And as you see, the loops are not under compression tension, so they won't warp. Quite flexible. And the power is labeled there so that there's no error. Meanwhile, many studios were designed and inserting other lenses of the rigid lenser or other kind of implant techniques. There's no voice. So, uh, Anis was designing a special lens with a special capsulotomy. Same did uh, Binkers with mustache lens and uh, also Galand with his own uh, Galand lens. But new changes uh, were uh, on the horizon and uh, the soft lenses. And Packer was the first publishing a paper on EMA lens in a rabbit eye. I'm Dr. Tom Mazzocco from Van Nuys, California. I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about some of the new and exciting developments in implant lenses, especially with regard to new materials and new designs. This lens design, as you can see, is a single material throughout and molded in one piece. The lens is made out of silicone rubber so that it can be flexed and yet spring back into its normal shape. But someone else was developing and implanting other IOLs for small incision uh, use. Comparing the dry lamps on your left and the hydrated lamps on your right. This is a measurement after 20 minutes where you see very clearly that it's already started to hydrate and increase in size, where it is already seven and a half millimeters. Kenman, with his genius, did not stop producing ideas and designing iOS. The wings act as opaque capsule. You see the wings sliding? under the optic and folding as the lens goes in the capsular bag and now the wings open up again. The optic is now placed on top of the haptic as if it had just been inserted through a shooter and opened inside of the eye and the eyelet is placed over the projection and the periphery of the lens is gently depressed with a hook and that will engage the eyelet into the... And in the ophthalmological world in the meantime, invasion followed the one another with extraordinary rapidity in machines, microscopes, lasers, or substances that to improve cataract surgery. And here you can see some of them. And the inventors of the YAG laser. And the design of lenses continued to evolve. And so did the materials. And here I'm presenting the first bifocal lens by Ken Offer. And uh, the design of the materials continue to evolve and still continue, and you can see here some of the modern iOS. Let me now show some photos of the pioneers, Ridley, Strampelli, Joyce, Bingcroft, Epstein. When I was a, a young doctor, I had the pleasure to meet all of them. I see you, see you here with uh, Ridley, with Sinsky, Joyce, Bingcroft, Galland, Kelman, Schering, Kelman again, Arnold, Pierce, Bissimico with our wives, Mikey Blumenthal. And before I close uh, 
my lecture, I want to show you how was the production of eye oil at that time. This is the Strampelli eye oil production. I don't want to talk about this uh, lens production. It's better if you just see by yourself what uh, was done at that time. It was, uh, in my opinion, an extraordinary video, this one. It is an extraordinary video. It was an extraordinary way to produce lenses uh, at that time, but uh, unfortunately, they was not enough good for the perfected uh, and uh, delicate organ of eye. And uh, many of those lenses has been explanted, as I told you before. And even not the Russians did better. Is the, at the Fyodorov Institute in Russia. Certainly today, the IO production is much, much different and much better. If you want to deep the history of iOS, there is a book written by Richard Packer and myself, where there is a nice chapter on iOS history written by Domenico Bucuzzi. I deeply thank all of the contributors to my video. They really did a good job, and I appreciate it very much. And I thank you for listening to my presentation. As you, can, as you saw, the videos that I found, they are very, very special. I really did a lot of work for fine. I really called friends, and uh, many of them, they, uh, they helped me on that. Very, very, it was very enjoyable to really cooperate with friends.